So we're going to be learning two Maimarim today. We're going to be learning the first Maimar is Vijayashat HaMalach, and the second Maimar is going to be Vitais of Esther. So the first Maimar, Vijayashat HaMalach, Esther, Hashar, Ben Hazav, Vitakam, Esther, Vitam, Ben This is a, well, this is a, this is what's happening when the, when Esther is coming to Achashverosh, after her three-day fast, she's requesting that Achashverosh and Haman uh, join her for a meal. And the king is going to extend his scepter towards her, and she grips the top of it with her hand. And so the altar is going to point out that the next time that a scepter is mentioned, and the next time that Achashverosh extends the scepter to Esther, she doesn't hold on to the top. As well, the second time that it comes up, it almost sounds like Achashverosh gives her the scepter. And so Altar was asking about both of these incongruencies. What is the difference between the two phases of the scepter and the Purim story? As well, the altar was wondering, what is the practical application for us? How do we live this, this reality of the scepter? Now, the, to begin, we know that Esther is a, is a reference to hiding. And this refers to both the time of Gaulus, the time when the Shekhinah is hidden, and the, the Jew in Gaulus, that a Jew in Gaulus has... The, has this, the godly spark in his, of, of his neshama. And yet, because the Jew in Gullah spends his time entrenched in physical things, it prevents us from loving God in the way that we want to. And so our love of God remains hidden. And the, uh, the process of bringing out that love is something that is different for every single Jew. Whereas in the times of Mashiach, when the Abishur is revealed, everything, we're going to leave that Esther state and we're going to enter a state in which we all experience godliness at the, in an equal way. Now, the next step in understanding the relevance of this is to understand Purim itself. So we know that the, with the Yom Tif of Purim, it says in the Gemara, that the Yom Tif of Purim is going to be the only Yom Tif that survives Mashiach. Every other Yom Tif is going to stop. And the Alter Rebbe also mentions another Gemara that seems to contradict this one, that says that Halachas will not disappear when Mashiach comes. And the Mithra Rebbe interprets this, saying that the that the Yom Tif is the time to connect to God. And that, and that the Alter Rebbe is asking that how could it be that Yom Tif which is such an important part of our lives, would disappear, whereas the mundane, seemingly insignificant halachas will, uh, will live on. Now, <clears throat> before we understand that, we have to understand what the function of Yom Tif is at all. So al says that during the time of Yom Tif, we the, the whole Jewish people are raised up. When God reveals himself in this Yom Tif sense, all Jews experience it, all Jews respond to it. And what this does is it gives us an extra boost to fight Sitra Akra, to push back on Sitra Akra. And the, the, uh, the, quint- with the quintessential, um, the quintessential uh, reference of this is a Pasuk that says, It says that who is this who rises up from the desert with a pillar of smoke, a, per- a perfumed cloud of myrrh, of frankincense, for all the powders of the peddler. And the Altarev is going to describe how this Pasuk is a guide towards how to experience Yom Tif properly. So he says, first of all, we're all stuck in the desert, which means we're all stuck in our physical, physical mundane realities. And the step one is that we experience Yom Tif and we rise up out of the desert. And the first experience we have is Timurus Ashan, is this pillar of smoke. And smoke, as any Boy Scout can tell you, is what happens when you burn wet wood when you experience the contrast of fire and water, and the, 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 what it produces is smoke. So when the fire of Yom Tif touches the water, so to speak, or the opposite of it, of, of it, which is our material experiences, what it produces is smoke. When we have that extra boost of Yom Tif, we produce this response of actually pushing away the, uh, the materialism that we find ourselves so entrenched within. Now, the next level is a little bit more edel, and that is the, the perfumed cloud. So Alter Rebbe says that there's a difference between, the, between, uh, 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 between smoke and this perfume, that the, the, the perfume is a more edel version of this. It's a more refined version of this. It's a tackling of the more refined components of our materialism, which are nonetheless a, 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 a contradiction to our service of God. Next is myrrh, which the Hebrew word is mar, and that is a, of course, a reference to mariras, to bitterness, that when we use our intelligence to, uh, to, to meditate upon the way in which we've separated ourselves from God, this creates an intense bitterness. And the bitterness is then followed with 
joy, which is Levina, is the next part of the Pasuk, is the frankincense, uh, that is the, the joy that we experience. And the Alter Rebbe uses, links it back to the Megillus Esther, that the, the women would sit in this spice experience before they met Achshverosh for six months. And the Alter Rebbe says that just like the spice experience was the women being uh, isolated within this almost intangible um, experience of smells that automatically lifted up their spirits and made them more more ready to greet the king. So too, the Jew, when he experiences joy, that lifts up every part of our experience. And it's not just joy, it's every facet of joy. As the Pasuk and Mikol Avkaz Rechel all the powders of the of the peddler, all the different versions of passion, all the different versions of excitement that we experience when we experience Yom Tov. Now, the entire paradigm of Yom Tov and Shabbos, of us being raised up in this divine experience and having the ability in that sense to push away in our own materialism can be encapsulated in the verse that Esther has offered the scepter and that she grips the head of it. That she is getting the opportunity to experience the kingship of, of God, and but it's significant that she only holds the tip of it, because were she, she, were she to experience the whole thing, were she, she to experience all of God's kingship, she would lose her own uh, independence, she would lose her own identity. And the, the, the glimmer that we experience of God's kingship when we have this experience is enough to, in, to to induce within us tremendous, tremendous love of God. We think about both the fact that he fills the creation and that he transcends creation. And we get a sense of the fa- of, of how, he, how, mu- how much he invested in creation. And this brings a tremendous, tremendous response of love and passion for God and a, the ability to push down uh, our own relationship with the materialism, to reject our own relationship with, the materi- with materialism. But again... Now, it, it's, it's very significant that what we're not experiencing is God as he is himself, because God as he is himself doesn't fall within the boundaries of, of filling the world or even transcending the world. God is any a violation, you see. And in that, in that persp- from that perspective, the God is completely alone. And neither Yom Tif nor Shabbos provide us with a true appreciation of that perspective of God. The only thing that will allow us to experience that is Mashiach, because when Mashiach comes, the dira is going to be bitach tainim dafka. It's going to be the 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 experience is going to be down here, and what it's what we, when we experience Mashiach, what we're experiencing is the reality in which everything is one with God. Not that the spiritual worlds overwhelm the physical world, but that the spiritual worlds and the physical world are shown to be one, and that the and that the physical world just as much manifests and in a sense even more manifests. The a revelation of God, and the Alter Rebbe gives us two uh, points of reference to understand this. The first one is the uh, conversation between Malachim and Sadikim. The Malachim say, "I am Ekaim Kavaydei." Where is the, the the place of God? And the Sadikim respond, "Kavaydei Malei Kol Arts Kavaydei." The right that the the, 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 the that the Malachim wonder. Where is God? Where is the highest place of his revelation? And the tzaddikim respond that actually mm-hmm. on earth is the highest point of his revelation. Another, and, and the, the, the second reference is that of Eishas Chayel, Taras Baila. During Gullus, right, during what, when we're stuck in this version of creation, the Baal, the, the revelation seems like it's the, uh, seems like it's the primary force. But when Mashiach comes, we're going to understand that the Eish Chayel is actually a teres baila, that the woman, the, the, the Makabal, is actually the crown upon her husband, that the woman is actually going to be the, the highest manifestation of the husband's abilities, of the Abishur's abilities. And that's going to happen when Mashiach comes. The, uh, of all the Yamim Taifim, whereas the other Yamim Taifim, like, for, for instance, Pesach, that was all about destroying Pare. The Yom Tif of Purim is paradigmatic of the of the the of the world working towards a revelation of God, because in the Purim story, the uh, Achashverosh is not only the one who signs the decree against the Jews, but that same voice is the one that signs the decree to save the Jews. That the that the the story of Purim is all about the Tachtenim serving as a as a revelation of God. And so the Alter Rebbe has now brought us full circle that the, the Purim is going to survive 
the coming of Mashiach, because Purim is, in a sense, the essence of Mashiach. Purim is the story of Ishapcha, not that of Iskafia. Now we can understand the contradictory Maimar Chazal that we mentioned before, that said that the halachas are going to last after Mashiach comes. The Alter Rebbe says to think of this in terms of the Pasuk that says that my beloved runs like, and when he runs, he appears to me to be like a deer. And so he says that a deer runs, the, and, and when a deer runs, it turns its head backwards. And, and it, we, we, one might think that since it has its head backwards, it's not really investing. But since the head is the home of the entire, uh, of, the, of the mind and the, the essence of the person, of the being, um, so that indicates so that the the its seeming disattachment belies its actual investment, and the Alter Rebbe says that the same thing can apply to 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 Torah and particularly halacha. That although halacha would appear to be the bottom of the of the hierarchy, the bottom rung, it's actually the place in which the Abishur invests his total chachma uh, the the chachmas baruch hu, and we can use that that Torah to refine the world because of the in the sense that Chachma is periru, that Chachma has the ability to refine. And the Altar gives several beautiful, beautiful examples. He says that somebody who is a salesman, who knows the relative value of different animals, will can use that expertise when it comes to knowing how the Bediyas Abachar works. And the butcher who knows the anatomy of the animals will be, can use his knowledge to, uh, to, to, to navigate the laws of kosher and the laws of um, of Karbanas. And so too it is that with all halacha, all halacha is, a, is, is hugely relevant in the, in the physical world. And what it allows us to do is to, uh, is to, is to bring God into the nuances of our lives and to bring God into the nuances of the world. And the final example Alter Rebbe gives is that of a, um, is that of a watchman that needs to understand the nuances of uh, of, of, uh, of emotions as well, because of the halachas that once somebody is doing one mitzvah, he's pater from another mitzvah. The watchman has to understand the nuances of when he has to, uh, when he is allowed to give tzedakah and when he's not allowed to give tzedakah. While he's engaged in his job, he would not be allowed to give tzedakah. And so halacha not only permeates all aspects of the physical life, but all aspects of emotional life as well. And all of that is deeply, deeply affected by uh, by by halacha, and so all of that it becomes refined when we learn halacha and when we engage in halacha. And how do we do this on a personal level? So the the uh, we bring yet another pasuk that says he neza that he stands behind the the walls. And the explanation is <clears throat> that God is revealing Himself in through through the Torah. However, there's a wall in place. And the, 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 that wall is our sins, is our entrenchment, is our engagement in Gashmias that makes it, that makes us perceive his revelation as being distant, as being, uh, separated, separated from, from us by a wall. And the solution to that is to make windows as it's, the pastor continues that he peers through windows and he, he, he glances through the lattice work. So a, a window is a hole, a complete, a large hole in a wall. A lattice work is a small, is, is a, a, a over overlay of boards that leads to a very, very small holes in the wall. And the Alter Rebbe uses his muscle that the, uh, that, that we, we, we need only, uh, pierce the hole, a hole the size of a needle, and the Abishur will expand. That when we are willing to approach Torah and approach our lives with God in mind, God will expand that and will allow us to see our lives as more godly. And we can now bring it back to the story of Esther and understand how the story of Esther is deeply, deeply relevant to our own journey. <clears throat> Before Esther comes to the king, she, it says that she's standing in the courtyard, like the Jew who's standing in the desert. The first, the first step is that we are, we are, we are lost in a desert of materialism, and then we begin to experience a revelation of God that might happen on the average yomtiv, and the, and that is the beginning of the approach to the king. <clears throat> but that, that alone is not enough. That alone be, be, means that we remain in gullus, and we be, continue to see materialism and spirituality as in conflict with one another. The next step is that the. 
that she defeats Haman. And this time, instead of just getting to interact with the head of the scepter, instead of just getting to interact with a glimmer of godliness in our lives, we actually get God as he is himself. We get the per the end of the Purim story, which is that the Gashmias, which is that Ahasuerus, is actively engaged in bringing a revelation of God into the world, that the Ahasuerus, instead of listening to Haman, gives the exact same power of the signet ring now to Mordechai. And the... The and, and in that sense, it's a complete, um, it's a complete ishapchos. It's a complete, um, not not iskafia, but uh, but actually ishapcha. And in the final moment, after she receives the scepter, it says that Esther stands up, that she stands up to be to uh, to 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 attain a, a complete um, reversal of roles. That she's no longer lost in the desert as she was before. The Nisham is no longer lost in the desert as it, as it was before, but instead it's standing up in front of the king in a sense higher than the king, which brings us back to the Aishas Chayel That she now, uh, that, the, that, the, that the Nishama, through the process of the Purim, through the Purim process and through the Halacha process, the Nishama uh, gets the opportunity to understand how not only can we does, does a revelation of God in this world mean that we can control the uh, materialism, but that we can actually use materialism to reveal God? Now, the second mimer we're learning is the mimer of Atais of Esther. It says that, that Esther <coughs> continues to speak to the king, and she speaks before the king, and she falls upon her face, and she cries. And she, she begs that the king will uh, will undo the wicked decrees of Haman and do undo the plans of Haman. So the Alter Rebbe's first question is, how is it possible that the Abishter, to, how is it possible to prostrate oneself in front of the Abishter when the Abishter himself has no body? And the, 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 the deeper question of the Mamar is going to be, what in what sense can we be lost that we feel the need to prostrate ourselves before God? And what is the process of return? So to, be, to, to understand this, we have to understand the nature of davening and the ability that a Jew has to, to, to engage in a conversation with God through davening. Now, when it comes to Purim time, we are called uh, from the name Esther. But <clears throat> and the, other part of the, the other part of the Jewish identity is many other names. And particularly, the names we're discussing now are that of Rachel, and that of and that the, and that of Tzayin. So the <clears throat> when a <clears throat> the Jewish community is called Esther, as we discussed in the last mimer, and but in another sense, the Jewish community can be called Rachel. Now, the Rabbi is going to contrast those two services. So he says that a lamb is based on the uh, pasuk that says that the lamb stands before the shearer. Uh, and is silent. And then we also find that it says that the sheep uh, stand before the slaughter and they extend their neck. So when a Jew is in both of these states, in, the, in, in this state of subservience, the, 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 the Jew is responding to, uh, to a divine experience. The Jew is responding to what the Abishter wants. And we are totally um, dedicated to doing exactly what he wants. We have a complete awareness, and we have a complete awareness of the fact that the Abishur is revealed in the world, and we want nothing more than to do what he wants, and we are, like these sheep and like these like these lambs, completely um, dedicated to following through with, what, with whatever it is that the Abishur wants. But when we are in an Esther state, our, uh, our, our divine um, identity is hidden. And the Altarab stresses that it does not mean that it's gone, but it means that it's hidden. It's in a state of Esther. It's in a state of Anechi Hester Aster Panai the that it, but, but, but since it is hidden, it's our job to reveal it. That Esther is called a, ro a rose among thorns, that the, the, while the rose is among the thorns, the thorns are so prevalent that it becomes almost impossible to identify the rose among them, and that it is our job to remove those thorns and to reveal that uh, that that essential relationship, that essential connection to God, and that is the Esther journey. Understanding the Esther journey has to do with uh, with looking back at that pasuk, Anaychi es Hester Aster Panei Bayim Hahu, and the Altareb is going to focus on those words Bayim Hahu on that day, and he's introducing us to four different stages. There's Bayim Hahu, Belaylahu, 
Biyom Hazeh and Belayla Hazeh. So Biyom Hazeh is from the is is from the pasuk Zehayim Asa Hashem Negila Bresbachaboy. The 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 then then we have the pasuk Vayesh Hashem Biyom Hahu. The 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 and the, on the Layla side we have Halayla Hazeh Leil Shimurim and we have Belayla Hahu Nadudash Nasamelach. So he says that the word Zeh means that the thing that you're referring to is present. When you say something is this, you're saying that this is present. As we say, this is my God that I can identify. And so when the when we relate to God in a Zeh form, we are relating to him in a, sen- in a sense that we feel like we can see him. We're relating to him in that we, we he's, uh, is a complete part of our lives and there's a complete state of revelation that we are experiencing. Now there's the Zeha Yoim, that which is that the which is that the person understands and perceives God to the degree that he does not perceive uh, reality as being significant. The person perceives that all of our reality is simply a, a front for the deeper reality that is the Abishter. But then there's also Balaila. There's there's uh, there's also a Lila form of that, and in that form. We perceive reality as being the as being real. We perceive the darkness as being real. We are in a state of Lila, and yet we are also in a state. We we are we are still in the state of Belayla Hazeh Lel Shimurim. We still have a reality of God, and the Alter says that this has to do with focusing on the revelations of God that exist in this world. As it says, that we, although we accept the realities of this world and we are too deeply entrenched in materialism and in the in what we perceive to be the reality of the world, to be able to uh, disassociate ourselves from it, we make the active effort of appreciating the godliness within the world. <clears throat> and this requires a tremendous amount of faith. It also has a practical service. Now, Terb is going to quote a Zayhar, which says that we were in Mitzrayim for Reish Dalad Vav years, for 210 years. And in Mitzrayim, we worked with Chaymer, with Levenim, and we worked in the field. So it says Chaymer, the clay, is a reference to the Kalva Chaymer. I'm learning Tyre with Kalva Chaymer. The Levenim is the bricks, are a reference to Libun Hilchasa, of learning practical halacha. And the field is a reference to the Zayar to the Brisa. Now the Alter Rebbe says it's true that anybody that agrees to engage in Tyra that accepts the yoke of heaven upon themselves, accepts the yoke of Tyra upon themselves, is freed from the yoke of um, of the of earth, as it says in Pirkei However, the Alter Rebbe says that there's even a way of somebody who finds himself trapped in the night, in the Lila, to turn that Lila into Lila Hazeh through this process. So he and he uses a, a reference, a uh, Gemara, that says that the Abishter asks in the times of Mordechai, what is the the what, what is this calling of this bleeding of a of a goat, and the of kids, and the Malachim answer that this is the voice of the Jewish people, and the obvious question that one might ask is how can God be curious as to what a sound is. How, how does God not know? And the the so the, and what the Altarab explains is that when a kid, when a goat cries out for its mother, it's crying without any seichel. It's crying without it bleed bleed das it's, it's only a simple cry of a child crying out to its to its parent. And so when we cry out to God, we are crying out in a way that is illogical. But the the but and but God's response <coughs> transforms our um, our expression from the illogical, from the subrational, from the sublogical to the super illogical. That when God responds, that He doesn't know where the call is from, He is responding from a, from a, a place of lamaylam and hadas, from from a place that transcends logic, and that in turn. Uh, informs our call towards him as being one of the um, of the kid calling out to its mother, of the of of a call that is that is super logical, of a call of a of a call for God that is that transcends our that transcends logic and doesn't is not sub, uh, subliminated to logic.
And so when the when the Jew learns Torah and calls out to God mm -hmm. in this truly authentic way, this uh, this leads to him responding in a way that turns our Lila into a Lila Hazet, that we have the, that, that, that this allows us to feel God's presence in a very real way in our lives. And this was the miracle of Purim. This was the, this was, this was what happened at Purim was that the that Mordechai taught the children and he taught them particularly the, the Torah and the, and, and he taught them pra particularly practical halacha. And this, uh, and this influenced that the uh, that the the the, the journey towards Biyam Haza this this influenced a revelation that act, that ended up happening practically, and Alter Rebbe ends off that the war against, now the war against Amalek is a war that happens in every generation, and in every generation the the that most of our conflicts have to do with nations of the, of the with the nations of the world and the evil that each one of them represent, but. In each one of the, in each case, the, our response to evil is simply to overwhelm the evil with more holiness than the opposite that the evil represents. When it comes to Amalek, though, Amalek has a unique challenge. It represents a unique challenge, and that Amalek is uh, is that that Amalek is arrogance. That an arrogance, by its very nature, is um, is almost impossible to combat because the arrogance has no source. It's simply haughtiness and simply arrogance that is that is baseless. And so the and and the plan that Haman had was to de implant deeply within the uh, within the, the the essence of the universe and the essence of the Jewish uh, identity this this arrogance um, and by that by that token subvert our entire connection to God. And the response is to completely overthrow uh, Haman and to, to, as it says in the Megillah, to thwart that which he had planned, to hit him not only um, in the practical sense, but even in the, in his, at the, at the, in, in the intellectual sense, at the plan level, which is why the, uh, the solution to Haman was the hanging on the tree and the hanging on the tree um, at, the, at, the, at the height of 50 Amas. Which was a reference to the the fact that Haman was um, confronting us with arrogance, and we responded by saying that God is much much higher, that God is much much greater.